Good afternoon and welcome back, Governor Hochul. The last two years have been extremely difficult around the state and for SUNY Upstate Medical University. Surprisingly, they have also been our best years. When we needed a reliable COVID test, the best saliva tests in the nation came from Upstate. And by conducting over 2 million tests on 60 campuses, we kept SUNY open and 300,000 students safe. When we needed a vaccine, the worldwide leader for trials of the first COVID vaccine came from Upstate. COVID patients were less likely to die if they came to Upstate as compared to the majority of academic medical centers in the country. We don't usually get to say this, but I will. Upstate Medical University, right here in the heart of New York, did more to respond to the pandemic than any other academic medical center in the country. <laughs> Upstate also serves patients from a third of the state. When we did struggle with huge demand and staff losses, we were fortunate to have a governor who understands the importance of working hand in hand with hospitals. Not just words, not soothing words, but real action. Governor Hochul sent up state ambulances and two invaluable disaster medical assistant teams and has asked for further assistance from the military. Governor Hochul, thank you for being a champion for our state in the fight against COVID-19. And thank you for your steadfast leadership in ensuring Upstate has the resources we need to serve as our 19 county region's only academic medical center, allowing us to treat anyone who walks through our doors. As we continue to battle this virus, I'm confident that Governor Hochul and the state will be right there besides us providing resources and support. Thank you, Governor. Now it's my honor to introduce to you Governor Kathy Hochul. Thank you, thank you, thank you. First of all, when you think about extraordinary leaders during a pandemic, you have to think about what the leader of SUNY Upstate has accomplished. Uh, Dr. Dewan, I want to thank you for, first of all, early in the pandemic, I came to visit the incredible research that was being done right at your campus. It was extraordinary, but also the way that you innovated ways so we could test so many more students. And that's why we were able to keep our colleges functioning during this time. And even most recently, to be able to open up our college campuses when they were closed to students, but use them as testing sites and vaccination sites. So, so thank you. You are a gem. We are so grateful that you are here right in the heart of New York State, and we'll continue to rely on you for innovating solutions and treatments, but also being there as you have been uh, with the resources. So thank you so much. I also want to acknowledge some of our elected leaders who are here today. And, you know, when you're in the trenches during a pandemic, uh, you really get to know the character of people and their willingness to just do whatever it takes to protect citizens. And I want to start with uh, someone I worked with a long time, Mayor Walsh. I want to thank you for what you've done. Ben Walsh and I, even during the pandemic, we walked around the city of Syracuse to let people know that there are still businesses and restaurants and small little mom and pop shops that needed attention. So even when things were still tough and the numbers were still high, we were out there working closely together. And I want to thank you for your leadership as well. And our county executive, Ryan, uh, I want to thank him for being a partner to the state, making sure that we do what's right to keep people safe, making sure that the resources were here. You made sure that you had that close connection with us so you could ask for what you need right here on the ground. And I want to thank you so much for uh, County Executive Ryan McMahon for all he does. He's a great friend and an ally as well. So thank you, County Executive McMahon. <laughs> We also have the CEO of SUNY Upstate, Dr. Robert Corona, is here as well. I want to thank him for all his great work, as well as uh, we have Council President Helen Hudson, Common Council President. Hello, Hel Helen, how are you? As well as uh, Legislator Peggy Chase, Minority Leader Chris Ryan from Onondaga County, Councilor Jen Schultz from Syracuse Common Council, and all their elected leaders here because 
You have been incredible during this pandemic, and I want to thank all of you for helping uh, be at our side as we try to give hope to people and let them know that there's programs and ways to help people, whether it's with getting assistance for child care centers, health care, our hospitals, people in need of eviction assistance. So uh, I want to thank all of you for being such incredible supporters. And all the first responders we have here, let's just turn around and look at the individuals who are still all these months later. All these months and years later are still putting on a uniform, heading out there, suited up for battle. Ladies and gentlemen, these are our incredible first responders, and I want to thank them for all they do. And we have called upon them to do so much. And I guarantee one year ago last week when I opened this facility to be a mass vac site, there's no way any of us dreamed that we'd be gathering here and still having to provide vaccinations one year later. But we have done an amazing job. This site has stepped up. We've done nearly 500,000 vaccines right here in this very site. And I want to thank everyone involved for uh, who've been showing up and showing up and showing up. Thank you for what you do for us. Uh, and I have been here many times. Uh, it's kind of more fun to come in the summertime when I have to go get my sausage and go see what the butter sculpture is this year. And, uh, you know, the, cheap, the chocolate milk, was it 25 cents for the chocolate milk? Yeah, that's always a personal favorite. So uh, I've always been here. And, and even last summer when I was brand new governor, I still came because I wanted to show how important this was to me. It's an important asset. It's a, it's a statewide treasure. So I want to thank everyone here at the fairgrounds. And uh, like I said, we've done uh, 465,000 doses already here, and we're continuing to keep up that effort. So I wanted to thank everyone involved in this effort, but also just want to take a moment. Uh, literally one week ago, I offered the state of the uh, budget, the budget address, and it is a very good budget for this region. And you know this is home to me. Uh, I spent many years here as a student. I come here often. I was very privileged to speak at the Syracuse University commencement back in September. Again, on the job just a couple of weeks, but I wanted to uh, show how, value, how much I value this region, important part of our state. So, so what we want to talk about is uh, how we're going to focus on money for this area. And we've talked about I-81 for a long time. Uh, as a Syracuse University student, I used to walk behind under there and say, yeah, it's kind of scary sometimes, not sure I should be walking here. And I know that we could do so much better with the neighborhoods around there, but also to uh, really right the wrongs of the past. And I spoke about a similar situation in Buffalo just Saturday to talk about how a beautiful Frederick Law Olmsted Park Parkway, Humboldt Parkway, was just eviscerated when a giant highway came through known as uh, 33, known as the Kensington as well. We had the same situation here in Syracuse. And you just have to step back sometimes and say, what were they thinking? They had no regard for urban communities, communities of color, and I do believe that they thought that they didn't have the political clout to stop something. So there was very little resistance because they weren't well represented. These communities did not have a voice to represent them. So back in the 50s and 60s, um, decisions are made that we still have to take the time to correct the wrongs of the past, and that's why, why we have $1.1 billion in our, in our budget to go forth with the community grid project in Syracuse. And we're going to remove the existing structure, uh, new community grid, new green space, safe pedestrian. I love the sound, safe pedestrian and bike, bicycle access. Also very exciting for our friends in labor, 25,000 good paying jobs right here as we build this back over the next years. And uh, just to give you a timetable, our draft environmental impact study will be done very shortly uh, this spring, and I'm always pushing things to be done, but we're going to do it the right way. And so we anticipate that the DO will have a, DOT will have a groundbreaking this fall, this fall, so get ready for that. I'm also very interested in proposals like Blueprint 15, because there is a community that is crying out for help. And this is a once in a generational opportunity for us to respond to those needs with a thoughtful plan de devised by the community. And I know the mayor has taken many steps toward this. There's a lot of ideas. Also take a look at what was done in Rochester when they corrected the wrongs of having the inner loop uh, out there and they were able to rebuild on the land there. And now there's beautiful neighborhoods, affordable housing, uh, uh, small shops and restaurants. So that's what the opportunity uh, lies before us as we reimagine this neighborhood and make it just incredible. So people will look back someday and say, yes, that was the right way to do this. And the community will be so important as we develop the East Adams neighborhood. 
Also, I want to make sure we have continued funding for uh, mass transit, Centro, $42.4 million, and that is a whopping 13% increase as opposed to a decrease. So uh, that'll be there to make sure that we have easy, accessible ways for people to get to their jobs uh, and continue to invest in public transit, our bus lines, et cetera, to make sure that we're also protecting the environment. These are environmentally smart ways to uh, approach the future. Also, something that I'm very intrigued with is the Syracuse Developmental Center. Uh, this is an opportunity for us to seize on this property. It's a 628,000 square foot building, long abandoned. It's vandalized. There's broken windows. Uh, it is a disgrace. And uh, I'm again with our local leader here in terms of identifying that this should be a multi-use facility. Let's not be limited by anything or uh, let our imaginations run wild with what we can do. I'm very focused on two things, affordable housing, but also workforce development. And there are great opportunities, and we may be successful, we don't know yet, but with opportunities for new industries that are not even here yet. And I'm going to be excited uh, as we move down the path to ensuring that we have the workforce, the workforce that future employers are looking for, because I can deliver that, we can deliver the businesses and the jobs, and there's just no stopping us. So, so I believe that this redevelopment needs to get jump-started, and I want to focus on that with our local leaders as well. So I'm very excited about this. And that's estimated to create as many 400 jobs as well. So everybody, plenty of jobs out there as well. Another thing that we heard from our residents of our state, they need some relief. People who finally saw their income start to go up just a little bit, all of a sudden at the same time, inflation goes up. The price of gas, the price of milk, if you waited to get a new car, it's so much more expensive now. Rental units, housing. So we want to provide property tax relief. So we have $2.2 billion rebate going to about 2.5 million middle class homeowners statewide. Uh, the benefit here will be about $839. This is the largest rebate ever given by the state of New York to the residents of this state. And we're excited about also a middle class tax cut that we're going to accelerate. It was supposed to roll out over the next few years up to 2025. People need the money now. Let's acknowledge that. So we looked at our budget and said, how can we give tax relief immediately? That means about 6 million taxpayers will get relief as well. Small businesses slammed by this pandemic. And a lot of them had to spend extra money to expand their space, to have that room for social distancing or restaurants that even in a place like Syracuse, they want to have outdoor dining, which I think is incredible. And you have to pay for those expensive heaters and more expansion. Maybe it's in a parking lot or on the sidewalk out front. This all costs money. No fault of their own. Let's make it easier. Let's let them have a tax credit for any COVID-related expenses. Uh, as long as we're at the fair, let's talk about the fair. It's hard to believe there's more projects we could possibly do at the fairgrounds, but there are. And I see this as I come every year, and we're going to invest another $33 million with uh, fair goer and pedestrian safety upgrades. Also to work to, as we say, green the fair. What does that mean? Rain gardens, rainwater reduction systems, composting facility, and finalizing, yes, a greenhouse right here. So, so that's why I'm very excited to be announcing some of these projects right here. But we'll be back for many more. Uh, so get ready, get your, your shovels ready, get your scissors ready, because we're going to be doing a lot in this area, which is so important to me as well. But the, as I mentioned, the fairgrounds have been such a vital, vital partner of ours in fighting this pandemic. And that is why uh, we partnered, as we're anticipating a very difficult winter surge, and we weren't disappointed. It was a very challenging surge. We started talking about this in October. And we partnered with our local and our federal leaders to help fight this. And I want to thank President Biden for helping us deliver uh, this as a staging ground for 23 ambulance units. I had a, every week I'm on a call with either the president or the governors, and we're always putting in our request to the White House. Uh, 14 of the 23 ambulance units came from President Biden, uh, seven units from the state. And what they're doing, why do you need ambulance units? We often have to transfer patients from hospitals because hospitals have reached capacity in many parts of our state. They need to be able to transfer someone somewhere else. But if they don't have the resources or the personnel, and we're dealing with a health care crisis of staffing, which is why I put $10 billion in my budget to address this, uh, we can now can be smarter about how we handle patients. And these individuals and some of these vehicles represent that effort. In fact, I was just uh, in the North Country a couple weeks ago, December 29th, and I was up in Watertown and, uh, at Samaritan Medical Center. They said, we want to be able to transfer patients just hospitals in Syracuse area, but we don't have 
All we have are volunteer firefighters and EMTs to do this. So we really need professionals who can help with this effort. So that's why part of my winter surge plan was to really address the needs, the very specific needs of the hospitals in our area. So before I go into today's data, I just want to hit some of the milestones. I mentioned winter surge. Uh, we forecasted this exactly. We saw what happened a year ago. This is a clear roadmap of what would happen as more people gathered over the holidays. So look at our numbers. The blue is 2020. That was last year, kind of nice and flat there. And all of a sudden you saw the peak. Look at this year, the gold color. Uh, we saw a tick, uh, an up uptick Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas. And now we know there's one more vulnerability, which is a little hard to talk about, which is the Super Bowl that somebody else's team will be playing in. Uh, uh, I don't know why I had to say that. Uh, I had hoped to be there, but not this time. There's always next year. But so we're heading toward that, but it doesn't have to be our desk. We don't have to follow that model because this time last year, we were literally opening sites like this for vaccinations. Now there's no reason not to be vaccinated, no reason not to be boosted, no reason not to understand that the masks are making a difference. And that's why we're focused on all these tools. So the winter surge is not over, but we are far better positioned to deal with it. And what I see as I study the trends statewide is that upstate, it's lagging behind. We had a longer period before Omicron hit upstate, which was a nice longer period. We were watching what was happening in New York City as hospitals were filling up again and uh, the tests were, the testing rates were very high, positive rates were high. And now it's this area, central New York, Mohawk Valley, western New York, they are catching up, they've caught up. So the surge peak is a little bit more behind here, but we're starting to see some good numbers that I wanna share with you. But as we talk about being at the fairgrounds, I'm saying, I don't want to be on a roller coaster anymore. I want to go straight down. And let's, uh, let's hope that's what's in store for us. So we are going down. Look at these cases, our seven day average. It's always better to look at the seven day average. And I'll tell you why. We're all focused on our daily infection rates, but it's definitely a product of how much testing you do. At one point we were doing 450,000 cases. A lot of people want to get tested before the holidays. They're going to see older, older parents, grandparents before they traveled. And now we've seen fewer people want to get tested. So it does skew the numbers a little bit. So it looks a little higher. The fewer people getting tested might be getting tested because they're actually feeling symptoms. So yesterday, uh, our, our uh, statewide positive cases are definitely falling down. We had about 12,484, which sounded high at one time, but now it's compared to our peak of 90,000. January 7th, we had 90,000 positive cases January 7th. We're still in the month of January. What an extraordinary drop that has been an 86% drop in two and a half weeks. Uh, all the regions are declining, including upstate. Uh, yesterday, our central New York case were 500 and, I'm sorry, 958, and that's down from 2,800 just January 4th. So again, heading in the right direction, 66% drop in just a couple weeks. So, so central New York, uh, you're doing the right thing. We're heading in the right direction. Uh, so the trend's heading down. Uh, we're looking at even our percentage of positivity. Yesterday, central New York was 17%. 17 sounds high, except it's down from 26% uh, just a couple weeks ago. And statewide, we're little, still a little less than 10%, 9.6. And we were at 23 just on January 2nd. So as I mentioned, our, our testing has dropped a lot. We tested 129,000 uh, in the last two days. Get more people in to be tested. You know, some are required to be tested for their jobs. Uh, we want people tested. We want, this is another reason we keep schools open, making sure kids have test kits so they can stay in schools. But we have the capacity. We've built the infrastructure. We have the ability to have more people tested. So it's just another way to keep people safe because if you know, they test positive, they really need to isolate. This is how we can stop the continuation of the spread, which again has been working very far. But uh, also we monitor hospitalizations. This is a huge barometer of how we're doing. And we're still dropping, thank God, from the peak we were at two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, we had over 12,000, almost 13,000 people hospitalized. Now we're down to 9,800. So it's still high, but, uh, and we're also still losing our friends and family and our loved ones. 158 people we lost yesterday. And I saw that there was a milestone of 1,000 deaths in central New York here. And that's just, that just hits you. I mean, 1,000 people who thought they were going to be with us, otherwise perhaps healthy, and we lost them because of this pandemic. So, so never forget those individuals uh, who lost their lives to this pandemic. So statewide hospitalizations are down quite a bit from the week before. Regional hospitalizations, I mentioned, we're doing well, down about 20% down about here, and we're doing much better uh, overall. 
this is what kept me up at night. Not so much now, we're doing better, but for a long time, my concern was, what do we do with this winter surge? The numbers go up, the lagging indicator, hospitalizations a couple days uh, up to a week or two later, and we saw the, a huge spike in hospitalizations. But because we were ready, we prepared for it, we worked very hard to have surge and flex capacity. We had to limit uh, the ability for some hospitals to do uh, elective surgeries to give them more capacity, but all of that played into a better situation. So hospitalizations are down. You can see the drug. Those are significant drops. That is very good news. A 25% drop statewide over the previous week. Look what that does. Finally, finally, our health care workers in some parts of the state can take a breath. Look at downstate in particular. So that's coming here. Just help everybody to hang on. Uh, other than the southern tier, there's still a little spike there. But uh, and also, you know, I, I've mentioned this early on, almost half of our COVID cases in a hospital are not there because they're sick from COVID. You need to know this. So again, compared to the severe, now they're still taking up a bed. They're still requiring healthcare workers. They still may have, you know, need to be treated for a heart attack or another illness. They, so they still need attention and it diverts. The more people we have in the hospital because of COVID, it's still putting tremendous stress on the healthcare system. I'm not saying that's not the case, but it is reassuring to know that this variant has not resulted in so many people having to be hospitalized because of their illness. They just happen to be positive when they're admit admitted. So again, our statewide hospitalizations are continuing to trend downward. We're watching that closely. Um, we're making progress. I just wanted to report that we are making progress. I want to give you hope because I know you look at the numbers. You're always feeling like Central New York was getting called out. And I just want to let you know that we've taken important steps. We, we've uh, issued an executive order the very first day that anyone named Omicron. We didn't have, just think about this, how in, in just a couple of months, Omicron has become uh, part of almost every conversation. We never even heard of it. It wasn't named by the World Health Organization until November 26th, right before, right before Thanksgiving. But we jumped right on it because we saw the global trends. And that's when we started amassing supplies of testing kits and PPE and the mask. And we realized we'd need a strategy to pause elective surgeries. And at one time we had 47 hospitals that had to stop elective surgeries to give them more capacity. And today we're down to 32. So, so working with our hospitals, our hospitals are our partners. Uh, there are allies in this, uh, helping them have the flexibility they need was important as well. As well as my strong desire to keep kids in school. And that's why we are so aggressive in getting more testing kits. We ordered up to 85 million. We're 85 million. That's getting more than any state in the nation. But I said, I want to make sure there's never going to be a reason why we can't keep our kids in school. No more of this someone tests positive and everybody goes home for 10 days. They go back for three days. Someone else tests positive. They're home. Enough. That was almost as disruptive as the entire year and a half or year of remote learning. So keeping kids in school is best for their health. We keep them safe by making sure that they have test kits that go home with them if necessary. And I want to announce that as we're approaching the winter break, schools have different times, but between February and March, I want to make sure that we have enough kits uh, to have every child be able to have a test kit sent home with them before the break. They're exposed during the break. They don't go back to school if they test positive or if they come back to school and other classmates are positive that they can adjust. So I never want there to be a shortage of tests, just so you know this. So we're gonna make sure that we are ready for the, uh, the winter break and we'll have enough for everybody and we're starting again. It's all about keeping kids in school and stopping the spread and getting more kids vaccinated. We can do better on this. I'm still surprised and disappointed that we don't have more children vaccinated above the age of five. It's available, so we're popping up some more sites in all of our regions, seven right here in central New York, and we'll be doing those next uh, Tuesday to Thursday. So we'll be announcing our specific locations by the end of the day, but anybody, please, and all the people who hesitated because they said, you know, I'm not quite sure they're tested, you know, I'm not sure if it's okay, I, want, I don't wanna be the first. Hundreds of thousands of kids have been now vaccinated. It is safe to do so. And this is what gives us the confidence to know when they're in school, if they're exposed, they're going to be okay. And that's so reassuring for all the parents who stepped up and made sure their kids were vaccinated. I wanna thank all of them for doing that. We also talked a lot about nursing homes. Uh, we have already deployed 2.2 million test kits to nursing homes and other congregate settings. These people are vulnerable. They have individuals coming from the outside, whether they work there or whether or not they are uh, individuals just visiting them. You want to go see a loved one. And it was, it was painful all that time when you couldn't visit 
family and loved ones in a nursing home. We understand that. But finally, uh, because of our testing and focusing on controlling the spread, our cases are now down 30% in nursing homes. That's really important. And making sure we protect the staff and the residents as well. So we're seeing that great decline. That's down from 30% um, higher just uh, as of January 22nd. So vaccinations, I mentioned this. See the number they're not happy about at the bottom there? 26% completed series for five to 11 year olds. This has been out for a while. There's plenty of places, there's no excuses. Let's ramp up the outreach to people we know, our elected officials, the media, parents, community leaders, please help us. Again, we're gonna make sure that we can do everything we can and create accessibility. It's free, doctors endorse this, and it keeps families healthy. So again, boosters, get your booster because everybody who was vaccinated and boosted, not everybody, almost everybody had a much better experience if they did come down and, and test positive for Omicron. The, uh, the, uh, the effects were much, were minimal compared to what they could have been. The number of people in hospitals to, who are unvaccinated is off the charts. That sign is right there, but those who are boosted and vaccinated, uh, very few are ending up in the hospitals because of this. So that's really important. So these are the numbers we have on people getting boosted. So, so just to wrap it up, and I thank everyone for listening. Uh, this, this roller coaster is not over. I look forward to coming back next summer and having some fun on the rides and having a great time. We will get there, but if we continue to do what we've been doing all along, as much as it sounds like we keep saying it over and over, we still have more people who should be vaccinated and boosted, children in particular, and wear the masks, the ones that we know are, are more protective. If you're not feeling great, just take a day off. Go home and watch some good Netflix. I've got a lot of recommendations for you. Uh, and just, just know you're doing the right thing. You know, take care of my, my sister just, Came out, she sent me her negative test today. She'd been home for five days. She was like, what are you just gonna, I'm binging on Netflix. What else would you do? So that's the right answer. Uh, but all of you who stepped up and showed up, uh, again, I wanna thank all of our first responders, our elected leaders, and our, our allies in healthcare and at uh, SUNY Upstate, extraordinary. So thank you very much. And uh, we'll see you all again with more announcements and more great news for Central New York. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to take a couple questions. And it's hard to hear, so there's a, a mic in the back. Some kind of questions. Governor, welcome back to Syracuse. Oh, thank you. It's Thanks, Andrew. Older Andrew. than the last time you were at the fairgrounds. Yeah. Um, a couple questions. First of all, you paint a very rosy picture when it comes to hospitalizations. I'm not sure the hospital leaders would, would share that rosy picture that, that you have despite all the resources that have come forth on the, the ambulance contract and the National Guard. Also, I was in uh, Oswego County today where 12 students refused to, to go into school with a mask on, so their principal locked them out. With this court battle kind of back and forth between tonight and, and the end of the week, what policy should people follow? What would you say to those students who will not wear a mask based on this court order last night, as a student yourself, love to protest? Well. I would never protest in a way to compromise public health. I assure you that uh, that is not uh, who I am and nor anybody. I would simply say that we were, um, we disagree 100% with the conclusion of the judge who did, in his opinion, thought that the Department of Health did not have the authority to protect public health. Uh, and a, a judge in Albany, same fact pattern, came up with the opposite conclusion. So we believe this will be settled very shortly. I'm encouraging parents and students to continue doing what they're doing because the last thing I want to see is a different trend because people gave up on the mask really. Now I am so looking forward to the day to say these are history. We don't have to do this any longer. All of us are. I don't want to keep any requirements for safety in place a day longer than necessary, but I will not do it a day before we can do it safely. And that is my commitment. So I encourage people to continue to follow what has been in place, follow for the main reason, this is why we have kids in schools. Look at what's happening around the rest of the country. People aren't taking the same steps we took. They, didn't, they were not aggressive in getting testing kids out. They don't have a mask requirement. Kids were getting sick, they're going home, and their educations have been disrupted. I didn't wanna see that happen here in the state of New York. And with respect to hospitals, we are hands-on with them. 
to deploy everything from our National Guard. And just on the National Guard, in a couple of weeks, we'll have our very first class of medically trained National Guards graduate. Because I said, I have all these great National Guards. Can they go into hospitals and nursing homes? And I told them there were only a certain percentage were trained with the medical background they need. I said, okay, then everybody gets trained. So we're gonna be ramping up and adding another cohort of students in that classification. So, so we're aware of what's going on in hospitals. I'm not sugarcoating the experience in a hospital, and we're continuing to have 32 hospitals that can't do elective surgeries because they don't have capacity, but you can't argue with the numbers. I mean, that decline in people being hospitalized due to COVID is extraordinary. So that is a metric that I look at, and I will continue to applaud that and say that is happening in the right direction. Hi, Governor. Um, for your administration, what are the next steps that you guys are taking when it comes to the court hearing? And then what, is there a metric that you see or a data that you see when it comes to that's an excellent question and I've been monitoring this very closely because we have to look at what's going on I can look at childhood cases during the first wave there are almost no cases of children getting sick almost none it was such a rarity people thought kids were safe Omicron changed that dynamic we realized that children were becoming sick and becoming hospitalized, especially after exposure to family members after the holidays. We saw that because they, they literally were safer in school. So I'm watching the numbers. We'll look at what the numbers were before they went into effect. The, the, when the mask mandate went into effect, it was my first day on the job as governor. Well, what day was that? I think it was August 24th, August 24th. And we saw the trend happening and occurring where the kids, we wanted to get them back, but people were anxious about sending their children back. I said, here's how we can get kids back in school. So I'll be looking at our positivity, looking at rates of vaccination in regions. We can get those numbers up. I'm gonna feel better. I'll tell you right now, I'll feel a lot better if more kids are vaccinated about that. But also hospitalizations, how many pediatric hospitalizations there are. So I have a lot of metrics to look at and we will get to that day. We'll absolutely get to that day, and, I, and I'm looking forward to that as well. First part of your question was, you asked about the, is that the answer? The for your in terms of dealing with the, oh, the case. Uh, well, at 2 o'clock today, there was a hearing on our appeal, and the judge said he'll either give his decision later today or tomorrow. So we're, uh, you know, we're optimistic about that, and then uh, you know, we'll pursue all of our options. Uh, Governor, would you consider going to the legislature since that seems to be part of the issue? We disagree with their premise that it has to go to the legislature, but as I said, as I'm looking at all my options, that is certainly out there. But we, we're going to see, uh, I believe we'll win on the merits today or tomorrow when that decision comes down. And if not, we do have all those other alternatives, absolutely. All right, thank you, everybody. Appreciate you coming out.